This is the Wi-Fi Pineapple used by penetration testers. The Wi-Fi Pineapple is mobile, so you can connect it to a small battery pack and throw it in a backpack so that nobody even knows that it's there collecting data. The Pineapple has many capabilities, but my personal favorite is Evil Portal. Here I'm broadcasting an SSID that says Starbucks Guest. When you connect to the Guest Wi-Fi, it brings up this portal that looks like Starbucks. After you put in your information, I can go on my phone and check the log to see everybody that's tried to connect. And now I have your email and password. Serena, I showed that video to my wife earlier today and she was like shocked. She's scared it with 29 seconds of content. <laughs> Here's 29 seconds of content. She told me she's gonna go off Wi-Fi. She's not gonna connect to the internet anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> understandable. You're a fantastic content creator. So for people who don't know you, can you introduce yourself? and welcome. Thank you. My name is Serena, but a lot of people online know me as She Networks. I am a TikTok content creator. Um, I started off as a network engineer and over the pandemic, I started creating TikTok videos that related to technical concepts or turning popular TikTok trends into a, you know, technical video using that same trend and that did pretty well and so i started expanding my content into networking and cybersecurity, and yeah now i'm here I want to thank Cisco for sponsoring this video. True or false, you need to pay a yearly license fee to use Cisco devices such as these. Answer is that is false. These devices can actually be upgraded without even logging into Cisco's website. These three switches are Cisco Business switches. Here we have a Catalyst 1000 series switch, and here we have a Cisco Business 110 series switch. This is an unmanaged switch. This is a layer two switch. This is a smart managed switch, and this is a layer three switch. The cost of these layer three switches is from $270. Cisco have been very aggressive with their pricing of these devices, and you don't need to pay a license fee to use these devices or to upgrade them. You can actually upgrade these access points using your iPhone app as an example, or using the GUI. Cisco have devices such as these, which are aimed at small medium businesses and they don't cost a fortune. So tell me, when did you start posting on TikTok? Around December of 2020, I think. It's not that long. Yeah, it hasn't, it hadn't been super, super long. And you know, there's periods where I'll post a lot more than others, mainly because content creation isn't my full-time job. So I was just doing it, you know, after work or on the weekends, trying to create videos when I could. You are taking a concept a hacking concept as an example, and you're distilling that down into like literally 60 seconds. How do you manage to take all that content and distill it down into such a short you know, piece of content? I try and get the overall idea because I think when people are being taught very formally about these very big concepts, it can be kind of overwhelming yeah. where I think it's like, hey, just start off with this, like, what is it? What's the idea? What's the concept? It takes a couple takes, right? So I'll put something together and be like, that doesn't sound right or doesn't feel right to me. So I'll re-record or change things and move them around. And that's why some of my videos have a lot of different little takes and cuts is because I'm replacing certain things so that I can give you the most information in that amount of time. Obviously, I can't hit everything, but the idea is to walk away with a better understanding of that topic. Boomers like me, I've got to mock myself, <laughs> an old boomer like me would say you cannot teach concepts in 60 seconds, but you've literally proved that wrong. I think the important thing that I want to do is introduce that topic, tell them what it is, and if they're interested, you know, go seek out more information on that or ask me questions and I can make more in-depth videos. You know, with TikTok, I'm always experimenting the type of content. You know, I started off with some very basic networking concepts and then did some more complex concepts like uh, VLAN hopping secure your switches because we're talking about VLAN hopping. If I was going to attack a network, I would go for layer two. You can find a lot of lazy configuration at layer two. We're talking about the switching side of networking before we even involve IP addresses. The first way to accomplish VLAN hopping is through switch spoofing. I'll pretend to be another switch and try and convince a legitimate switch to form a trunk link with me. 
if I can connect to a port that allows for trunk negotiation, then I'll have access to all the VLANs going through that trunk. Once I have access, I can start collecting data. Make sure you configure access ports for any port that absolutely doesn't need a trunk. Another common way to VLAN hop is double encapsulation. You can use a tool called Scappy to modify the VLAN tags on a frame. Once I modify the tags, I can send my information through the native VLAN. And this is only really good for DDoS attacks because you're not going to get any information back. So secure your ports or switch spoofing. And I kind of thought those videos really wouldn't do super well because how large is the audience on TikTok that would be interested in VLAN hopping or switch spoofing? If I'm a hacker and I have successfully formed the trunk link and I'm able to spoof a switch, what can I do with that information that I gather? A lot of people are under the assumption that I'm interested in the traffic payload. And yeah, that can be helpful. Some encryption is weaker than others. But what I'm really interested in is the network information that I can gather. I can see who's sending and receiving data. I could create a list of devices that are on that network. If I have a list of hosts, then I can do a port scan and find any open ports. Let's say they have RDP open. Maybe I can exploit RDP and get access to their desktop. And from there, I can do a lot more damage, gather a lot of information. So I don't really care about the payload in that traffic. That's just one example. I was surprised, you know, sometimes you don't know what content you're going to put out thinking, oh, this is only really going to apply to a few people. And then, you know, you might hit 100,000, 200, 300,000 views. And I was very surprised. It's interesting because I actually created YouTube videos and I've got to like pump my YouTube videos with Scapey doing exactly what you, what you described. But you in such a short time explained the concept. But Tell me about the audience. Is it a very young audience? Um, are you trying to get people into cyber, into networking? Is that what you're finding that's happening with your content? That is the idea and that's what I would like to do. And TikTok in general, I think is a little bit younger of an audience. Yeah. So you kind of get people from all over the world who are interested in these concepts. But then you have people that have worked in the field for maybe a decade or more, and they're just interested in, you know, tech changes and there's new concepts with um, development and, you know, infrastructure as code or different security issues and vulnerabilities. So they like to see that content too, because sometimes you forget things like exactly. certain concepts, I'll have to go back and Google like, oh, I've definitely learned this at some point, but it's been a while since I did that. So having that refresher, I think is great for people who are interested too. Different ways that hackers can attack your network, let's talk about DHCP. DHCP is a protocol that allows your computer to dynamically receive an IP address without you having to manually enter any information. It does this by broadcasting requests out to a DHCP server and the DHCP server will grab an IP address out of its pool and assign it to you. An attacker can continuously ask for IP addresses until there's no more addresses left in the pool to give out. And this is going to cause a problem because now real people who need addresses aren't able to get any, and this is going to cause a denial of service. This specific attack is called DHCP starvation. The next attack is DHCP spoofing, and when your computer is broadcasting out and asking for an IP address, everybody on the network can see it, so this means anybody can respond to it. The attacker can sit there and say, hey, I'm the DHCP server, here's an IP address, and you should send all of your traffic through me. I'm the gateway. And this is a type of man in the middle attack. Like all content creators, you get the people who love it and then you get the haters. Let's ignore the haters for the moment. What kind of feedback are you getting? I get a lot of really great feedback. Um, people who are like, oh, I'm in a class right now that's talking about this. Like, this is great. And they're super excited to see it on TikTok because they're learning it in that moment. And, you know, just people who are interested in the new cybersecurity stories or just kind of some explanations when there's big outages, I'll go and talk about potentially why that might be that outage. You know, I had a video on the Facebook outage when their BGP routes yeah. disappeared off the Internet. Yeah, so it seems that Facebook is no longer a part of the Internet at the moment. And what I mean by that is. Facebook's no longer a part of the internet. <laughs> I've made a couple videos about BGP, but basically it is the routing protocol that connects all of our small networks into one larger network, which makes up the internet. So all of these smaller networks have BGP routes. They all get populated into routing tables and it's kind of used like maps. Well, for whatever reason this morning, Facebook is no longer peering or advertising its BGP routes. So nobody knows how to get there. 
which effectively makes Facebook not a part of the internet anymore. Yes, this can be fixed though, it's not like a permanent thing, so don't like worry too much about that. But it's definitely weird and it makes me wonder how this happened because I really don't have any idea aside from maybe some infrastructure as code gone horribly wrong. It doesn't appear to be malicious at the moment, but I'm excited to see the full story later. I get a lot of really great people that have watched my videos since the very beginning and new people and it's fun really building that community. You were interviewed by Vice, is that right? Correct, yeah. And so can you just give us the gist of what, what that article is about and you know the issues and the problems that you're encountering? TikTok, I think in general, is a newer platform and they rely pretty heavily on AI to moderate. It needs to be tuned a little bit better. And I think YouTube had this problem too in the past where they were taking down ethical hacking videos because they were like, oh, this is illegal or, you know, the certain concerns that there is about ethical hacking. And like I said, these videos are 60 seconds. So most of the time I'm just going into a very broad overview um, yeah. for things. And occasionally I'll do demos and things like that. But ultimately, if somebody was super interested in using those skills, Skills, there's a lot more work that goes into that 60 second video that obviously I'm not able to show and TikTok will strike down those videos and then I have to go through an appeal process and once you appeal the video that does go to a live moderator who will review the video and say yes this is okay or no it's not and there is this idea that all hacking is bad yeah. right so you will you probably get YouTube comments like why would you show this why are you teaching people this this, but we need ethical hackers like we need people to be interested in that to know that that is a field for them to go into if they're Fantastic. interested and hopefully if you can reach people that are younger who are interested in this and already doing things you can kind of bring them into a positive and ethical community versus them going out and finding this information other ways that might lead them into a not so ethical community Let's talk about password cracking and tools that hackers can use to break into your accounts. I want admin access into this blog, so I'm going to assume the username's admin, but I don't know what the password is. We can use a tool called Hydra that will help us break into this account. Hydra's already installed in Kali Linux, and here's how you can use it. First, we're going to specify Hydra, then the username of admin, and then we're going to use the raw queue password dictionary. Next, we're going to specify the target, which is going to be the website's IP address, and then the HTTP post form. Now Hydra is going to try every single one of the passwords in the rockyou.txt file until it finds a match. Okay, it looks like we found a match for admin. And we're in. You've got to get people interested in tech. And I think what you're doing is an amazing way to do that. I always say like, if they, if they look at your content and they see like you're doing the Hydra attack, you're actually showing how to hack a website, but it's like, okay, you show me in 60 seconds, the like the, the coolness of it, but you have to go and learn all that stuff. And that's where they get into, like you say, the ethical hacking community and learn, like go and try hack me or hack the box, get into that stuff. You make it look so simple <laughs> when I look at these videos, but I know as a content creator, how difficult it is to get demos to work. So, I mean, give us give us an example. How long does it take you to put together like one of those 60 seconds? What's the worst you've ever done? Like, has it been days or? A lot of the Hack 5 stuff that I have done takes quite a decent amount of configuration and setup before I actually get to the recording part and demo part of the video. What I do a lot of times, if I am doing a Hack the Box or Try Hack Me, I'll get a little bit of inspiration from there. And then yeah. it's kind of nice because it's like, all right, I'm learning and doing these things, but then I can kind of incorporate content on. So it's a little bit more streamlined for me. Um, I recently changed the way that I have been doing content or coming up with content ideas. It can take a couple days sometimes to really fiddle with something and make it work and do the thing you want it to do. You know, there's probably people who watch you that watch other creators um, like John Hammond and Ipsec, I think that's how you say it. Yep. But they do a lot of those like hack the box walkthroughs. People watching that can almost get a little bit of the wrong idea or have wrong expectations on how long it takes to actually present that write up, right? So there's tons and tons and tons of hours that go into that like 30 minute hour video. And so you're like, oh, this seems 
easy and cool and I love this and you start following along and then you're like, I'm ready to do my own thing and you get there and you're like, oh, this is not <laughs> as easy as it looks because a lot of the content creators do spend a ton of time off camera preparing things for videos. One way hackers try to move through your network is by gaining access to additional accounts and escalating their privileges. One technique to do this is called password spraying, where you try the same password on a bunch of different accounts and hopefully one of them works. Now typically the password is going to be a default password or a commonly used password. This technique is pretty good because it helps avoid account lockout and might not raise any red flags. And this is also why it's important to use multi-factor authentication on all your user accounts. One tip that you could do is create a dummy account that nobody should be logging into and then set up a rule that anytime someone tries to access that account, you would be notified. This can help you detect pretty early on if somebody's in your network and poking around in places that they definitely shouldn't be. For me as a content creator, it's much easier to make a longer video than a shorter video. Like what you're doing is compressing so much information into 60 seconds and you know a real like shout out for what you're doing it, it i understand how difficult that is as because you know i've tried it's it's very very <laughs> hard it's it's easier for me to ramble on for 30 minutes than it is to try and get that information and the essence of what you're trying to teach down to such a short amount of time so it, it's amazing tell us a bit about your process for anyone who perhaps you know is interested in creating content on tiktok and other places um, and i must mention you've got a youtube channel now is that right yeah, so I'm breaking into YouTube, at least trying. I'm having the opposite problem as you, which I think is funny because I'm so used to making short form content. I'm like, what am I supposed to talk about for 10 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> like it's too much time so i'm like i don't know like what i'm supposed to do <laughs> um but yeah so i'm going to the youtube route as well mainly because tiktok uh, monetization is a little bit more difficult on there than youtube and uh youtube is a little bit more forgiving for cybersecurity content creators it and so fun. i always worry about losing my account on tiktok because They'll ban my videos and I'll try to appeal, but at some point you get enough strikes, they're like, all right, you gotta go. So hopefully I can help and continue to make content on YouTube as well. Attention spans, you know, all the boomers like me will say, oh, attention spans of these young people is too short. <laughs> I think what you're doing is, is, is fantastic. So if you did shorts, that would be great. Um, I think we yeah. need more of that. Is that something that you're going to pursue then? Like put it on TikTok and then do shorts and then perhaps do long form content as well on YouTube? So that's the idea right now. I came up with a new process. Before I was just making videos when I had an idea pop in my head. I'm like, yeah. all right, I'll work through this. And, and now I kind of wanted to formalize the process a little bit more because I think for me, it'll be a lot easier to make more content with the idea like, all right, here's my little spreadsheet. And you know, I've, I've split up my content into different categories. So it's like, I want to go over a news story, you know, something in cybersecurity that's happening, happening this week. That's interesting. So like recently I covered the ransomware, the goodwill ransomware, where instead of the hackers asking for money, you know, they're saying, oh, we want you to go feed people in need or clothe people in need. So I'm like, that's interesting. And so I'll, I'll kind of cover that. I'll talk about different tools that you can use if you're interested in getting into cybersecurity, pen testing, bug bounties. Do TikTok trends, you know, keep it on brand for TikTok. But so I'll, I'll kind of put together everything in a little spreadsheet and then I'll create videos from there and, and pre-plan them out so that they can go out through the week. And then from TikTok, I will post them onto YouTube and sometimes Instagram. Although I do forget about Instagram a lot of the time. So yeah. So let's talk about process. So you do you just film on your phone or do you film with like a camera and then edit it? Or to give us a bit like be behind the scenes, how do you, how do you go about like creating this content? Yeah, so I experiment a lot. So when you look at the uh, Wi-Fi pineapple video, yeah. a lot more editing went into that than I typically do, mainly because I'm just kind of like, is it worth the time, right? So right. are you getting a good return on like, hey, can I get the same amount of interactions and get the same point across with less time putting into that video? But most of the time I'm just recording on my iPhone, nothing special or fancy or anything like that. Just me and my phone and the in-app TikTok editing. I've heard this about TikTok. Tell me if, you, if this is sort of true. If you spend hours and hours and hours editing a TikTok video, it doesn't do well. And then you just do some random thing with your phone and it does well. 
Yeah, I, that is very true. I think, you know, there's a lot more production into YouTube than there yeah. is for TikTok. And I'm learning that too, because I know what people like and want to see on TikTok, but on YouTube, I'm like, it's a little bit different, right? So people expect different things. People want to have that feeling like they're just having a conversation with you, that it's more just kind of one-on-one -on -one and um, it doesn't feel like a big production. It's very, it's a little bit more raw than you would maybe find on YouTube sometimes. <laughs> This file contains 32 million passwords, and you're probably wondering why can anybody access a file that contains 32 million passwords? Well, in 2009, a company called Rocky was breached using a decade-old SQL injection, and 32 million user accounts were compromised. The passwords were stored clear text so you could see the email address and the password for every single account user. They're all compiled in the rocky.txt file and are used for dictionary attacks. Here are the most common passwords that were used in that file. Now, a lot of companies obviously don't store passwords in clear text anymore. However, even in 2018, T-Mobile was caught storing customers' passwords in clear text thinking they were unbreachable. But you can download the Rocky file and see if your password's in it. People who are as old as I am, and I mean, I just keep, you know, it, I just think it's like my generation, if you like. They um, grew up where everything has to be polished. But is it true to say that a lot of younger people want just the raw, authentic, you know, content? Yeah, people really, I think, in my generation, and I'm kind of on that edge. I'm a millennial, but I'm almost Gen Z, right? And so yeah. I kind of have like the experience of both where I know how to communicate to millennials and I also know how to communicate to Gen Z, which I think kind of sets me up in a really good position. Definitely. But yeah, I think people are interested in the authentic and raw and just like, I struggle and you struggle too, you know? And so that's I, a lot of my videos to I kind of make fun of myself where it's like, oh, I've picked up Python like five times now and I have to go through like the introduction of Python every time. I think we all struggle with very similar things. And so often you just see these all stars, right? Yeah. That are just like, you know, turning out videos and, and hacking the boxes and getting awesome certifications, but that's just like the polished stuff you, you see at the end of the finish line, exactly. right? There's there's so many trials and failures and time and effort put in before you see that polished, congratulations, here's my accomplishment, you know? A lot of people I speak to, you know, have imposter syndrome. They feel they don't have the knowledge or the experience to create content or to teach others. I think that's crazy, but how did you feel, you know, did you feel that you had to get a whole bunch of search, you had to get a whole bunch of experience, or did you just decide I'm gonna create content with what I know already? Full disclosure, um, when I started making content, I had been an engineer at Cisco for a few years and I had a bunch of certifications and a college yeah. degree. But even with that knowledge, I mean, I still have big gaps, right? So everyone's gonna be. have these, be, yeah. these knowledge gaps. And while I'm learning about those gaps, I'm creating content on that. So, and that's like the best time in my opinion to really create that content is when you yourself are learning it and you're like, oh, I'm gonna put this together. And then even like, I'll, I'll look back at my old videos and I'm like, I know I did a video on that. And I'll go look back and be like, okay, exactly. yeah, this makes sense because you forget things and everybody's human and we all have to Google stuff every once in a while, so. I like to say that as an encouragement for everyone. I don't think it's necessary in today's world to, you know, get 10 years experience or 20 years experience, whatever, you know, some kind of milestone that people put before you start sharing with the community. You can share your journey. Oh, yeah. And I think what you've done, that's great. You said earlier that you can relate to a dif different generation. I think a lot of people want to learn from someone who is a similar age or similar experience. And I think it just adds to the community. Yeah. Guys like John are amazing, but it, more voices just add to the community. I get comments sometimes where people, well, one, people assume I'm a little bit younger than I am. Yeah. So my birthday is tomorrow and I oh, turn congratulations. 27. Thanks. Oh, congrats. <laughs> Um, but people, I think, assume that I am more of a college age. And so, you know, you're going to get mean comments no matter what. Like, yep. you can have all the certifications, credentials, all the experience in the world. Someone's going to have something negative to say. Always. Right? Always. So Always. sometimes they hurt. 
and that's okay. And you just gotta eventually just brush it off. And you know, at the end of the day, like I, I love making content and it makes me happy. It's something that I really enjoy doing. And that person's not happy, and that's why they're, you know, writing mean comments. <laughs> like Hate, haters will be they, haters. Yeah. Yeah, sure. exactly. So aside from content, just consistency. I know it's like the corny phrase of consistency is key, yeah. but learning something a little by little every single day is great because that's how you get that knowledge over time and you become an expert by just learning a little bit and a little bit every single day and just continuing to be okay with being uncomfortable and and being open to learning new things and saying like hey i'm probably not going to be very good at this in the beginning but i'm just going to keep working at it until i am semi-decent at it there's days where i feel like i know it all and then i wake up the next morning and i'm like wait none of that makes sense and then later i'll feel like oh wait it's all clicking and then it's not for years and years and years. The best way to, to learn is to teach. The amount of work you've had to do for some of these videos, you know, you make it look so simple, as I've said, but you know, you've got to have done all that research. You've got to have learned how it works and then you've got to present it in an easy to understand fashion. That means you're learning a lot, I would say, in the background. Oh yeah, I'm learning a ton, which has been fun. And that's how I ended up moving from a network engineer role into now I'm a pen tester. Yeah. which is a big jump and I'm excited and now it's just more stuff to learn. But, you know, through all that experience, it got me to a new phase, which I'm super grateful for. Good question. I get this a lot. I have a bachelor's and an associate's in computer information systems with a concentration on networking and information security. Currently, I'm in a master's program and I'm studying data center systems engineering. You started at Cisco. Was that your first job? Is that right? That was my first job out of college. Yeah, I worked at Cisco Tech. <laughs> That's amazing. So you went to college, what did you study? And then give us sort of like the history and then update us of what you're doing now. Yeah, so when I was in college, I went for computer information systems and I went through a Cisco Academy and it had a concentration on networking and information security. At the time, I wanted to go be a cyber operations officer for the Air Force and that didn't work out. And I ended up, you know, getting medically separated. And so, I was like, crap, I need to find a new job. <laughs> like I have to figure out what I'm gonna do. And so one of my friends had recommended applying at Cisco because they had a new high, like a new graduate program where you basically train for three months and then you go to a tech team on technology and you take support cases for anybody that has a support contract through Cisco. And I was like, sure, like I'll do that. And I went through the interview process and I remember being in college, they like flew me out to Raleigh, North Carolina. And I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like um, this is so crazy. Cause having a company pay for you to fly somewhere, I was like, this is so cool. And then I ended up getting the job and taking it and ended up in Texas working as a tech engineer for Cisco's uh, unified computing systems. Yeah, it was great. I love the experience. Oh, here's what they don't tell you about being a network engineer. And it's that your job is like 80% research and you will research something for hours or days even just so that you can tell someone like, oh yeah, no, we can't do that. And then you just never talk about it again. It just never gets talked about again. And then the other 20% is just getting screwed over by release notes and that's it. On the interview with John Hammond, which I'll put below, that was also a great interview. You said that you didn't know what UCS was, I think, when you started there. And that yeah. was like, how do you say, like, like getting thrown into the deep end. Like, oh, yeah. really, that was, how did you find that experience? I thought everybody was crazy there because <laughs> I was like, are you out of your mind? Um, because when I was learning Cisco, I learned about, you know, Catalyst. I learned all the enterprise route switch. Yeah. And UCS is a data center technology and its servers and there's a lot of virtual networking in it and i was like how am i gonna take cases for people who have been working on this product for a decade like yeah. what am i this like new college grad gonna tell them that they don't already know and so it was a very scary experience i mean i was like all right like if they think that i can do it then i'll give it a shot you know and and it did help that Again, there was other people who were going through the same thing as me. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, I don't feel alone in this. You know, they're going through it too. And so eventually, you know, I got there, I did training and I just started taking cases 
and you just learn. And sometimes yep. you see the same cases. Sometimes you see something that nobody's ever seen. And so you have to, you know, figure it out. But I did it. And looking back on it, I'm like impressed. I'm like, dang, I did that. But in the time, you know, you just put your effort and energy into that and giving yourself grace to learn and make mistakes, yep. you know, not in customer environments, but, <laughs> but you know, just it, it, it all worked out and I really learned how to kind of troubleshoot under pressure. I learned about so many different environments because everyone that you worked with had a different setup and were doing different things. And yeah, it was great. It was awesome. I think it's in those hardest times that you learn and grow the most because you're in the fire there. Yeah. I mean, they're not gonna contact tech unless there's a problem, like something that they can't solve themselves. Yes. And then I'm, yeah. I'm assuming the pressure's immense because they expect you to know everything about everything and get it done like immediately. Yeah, it can be like that. But sometimes though too, you know, these are network engineers that you're working with. So if they haven't figured it out and you don't exactly know right away, it kind of almost makes them feel like, okay, I'm not crazy or missing something obvious yeah. if the tech engineer doesn't know right away either. You're really working together as a team to solve that problem. But if I lay down and I play dead and I stay dead, maybe you'll get sick of being the monster prepared afterwards would you recommend it you know would oh yeah if, if anybody had the opportunity to do it i would say do it if you are interested in networking especially in that deep level they give you all the training you could possibly want and you have access to the engineers who write the code yeah. right and so i was like this is great like i love this um because i just felt like if i had a question i was very confident that i would be able to find an answer you can't know everything i think in life you need to know who to ask as well oh yeah and if you've got that support, it's massive. Tell us about the journey into cyber now because you've changed jobs uh, into pen testing. Yep. Correct. Yeah. So when I was graduating college is about when all of the cybersecurity degrees started popping up in forensics and, and, and ethical hacking. And I was like, dang, I wish I could have done that. <laughs> It was really interesting to me. And while I did learn a lot of security stuff in my degree, I was very interested in becoming more security focused. I started making a lot more security TikToks, doing hack the box, try hack me, CTFs, watching other creators videos who have been in uh, cybersecurity for a long time. And then I eventually applied for Black Hills Information Security, which is the pen testing company that I work for. The reason that I really liked them is they also provide a ton of free information and free training for people who are interested in cybersecurity. So I was like, wow, this seems like a match made in heaven. I'm like, I love making cybersecurity content and that's what they were doing. And so, you know, I, they had I think a similar belief as I did, and, and now I'm, I'm working there and learning uh, to be a tester. This looks like a USB adapter, but it's actually a keylogger used by hackers and penetration testers. While plugged into your computer, it's going to log everything that you type, and these logs can be accessed remotely by the attacker. They can even see a live stream of your keystrokes. The attacker can also upload malicious payloads and execute them from anywhere around the world. Then they can remotely exfiltrate your data. So will you do content for them as well? Yeah, the idea is to kind of do my content and their content and come up with ideas and topics that people are interested in learning about and hopefully just be able to share even more information. Um, so I always ask this question because, you know, as a creator, I think it's it's changed my life. Did you find that, you know, creating TikTok, being so active on Twitter uh, and social media opened doors for you or made it easier? How did that affect like sort of your journey? Yeah, sorry, my dog's snoring. No, right? no, are you? no, that's fine. You got to sh show us. Yeah. Show us. She, she's just like, hello. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> anyway, I'll let her take her nap. So, yeah, I think that really did help because I did get a lot of offers from people who really liked my content and just, like you had said, were kind of impressed that 
I was able to make these concepts so digestible in a short period of time. And you really have to understand what you're teaching about when exactly. you do that, right? Yep. You have yep. to really fact check, double check, put it all together. And again, that was something that I was doing completely on my own, right? I wasn't getting paid to do it. I just had that interest. And I think that's what a lot of people are looking for. I mean, I'm sure if they're subscribed to you and watching these types of videos, they're most likely not getting paid for that either and they're just interested in learning more and that's a really awesome trait to have some people just aren't interested in learning yeah. about it and going out there and seeking information you're always gonna be ahead of what you could be because you're doing more than just the bare minimum right for someone like me if i want to employ someone i always have this thing show me your work if you have two candidates for a position and one of them just gives you a, a, a resume and it's just a piece of paper and then the, the other candidate is like got TikTok videos or it doesn't matter it doesn't have to be TikTok or whatever it is and you can see what that person is doing you can very very quickly get an get an idea if they know what they're talking about just as you said i mean I'm amazed that you can take so much information and condense it into such a short amount of time. And that in itself is, is a skill, but it's like, how, you obviously understand what you're doing because you explain the important points in that short amount of time. I think it's the new resume, if you like. If you can put <laughs> content out there, it, it really, in my opinion, makes a huge difference. Yeah, and there's so many options for content, yeah. like blogs, podcasts, and, and that's the thing. You just have to enjoy doing it, right? Because at the end of the day, numbers are numbers and it's great to have followers and it's great to build that community, but that will eventually come when you continue to put out content. But the main person you wanna be doing it for, especially in the beginning, is yourself. I think some people look at other creators and try and be like, oh, well, they have it figured out. I want to do what they're doing. But be your own self, your own content creator, because you can provide something to other people that they might be missing with other content creators. Bring yourself. There's nothing worse when someone copies someone else, because you can see straight away, like Casey Neistat, famous YouTuber, people copied his style. And you can see like, this is just a clone. It's that whole thing, I think, be authentic, be your authentic self. And like you said, everyone has their own unique voice and their own take of th on things. Like you can explain something to a certain demographic and sort of like um, resonate with that demographic in a better way than I could. And I think it's important that everyone just shares who they are and shares stuff from their own perspective. Yeah, no, I agree. I think the authenticity and like you said, you sometimes see it's like, oh, this is very similar or just kind of a copy. And I get why people do that because it's yeah. like, oh, obviously this works, right? But if it's not authentically you, then you're not gonna do it the best because somebody already did it the best. So yeah. you're gonna do your own thing the best because that's you. If that makes sense, right? Hopefully that's exactly that right. Resonates. No, it does. I mean, it's like there's only one John Hammond. Um, right. <laughs> I'm not gonna try and do what John does because he's the best at what he does. Um, there's only one of you. So do be you. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that's advice for anyone who wants to start out in like creating content. I'm a strong advocate of put your content out there. I think Mr. Beast put it really well. Your initial videos are going to be terrible and that's fine. You're going to learn. There's no better yeah. way to learn to create content than to, to create it. Has that been your experience? My content has changed so much since I've started just because you learn what you like, what's easy, what comes naturally to you, what other people like. And it's a very evolving process and which is great. I mean, that whole idea is everything you do for even learning networking. At the beginning, it's like, oh, I kind of understand it. And the longer you do it, the more you kind of refine that skill. And it, it's same thing with content, video creation, blogs, writing, all that. Yeah, practice makes perfect, as they say. Um, yes. <laughs> just keep practicing and you'll just get better. I'm a networking person for years and you, you started in the networking world. Did you find that it helped you a lot when you started getting into cyber and is it helping you at the moment? 
Oh yeah. I think the biggest thing is you already have the vocabulary. Yeah. Which is great. I mean, there are some things where you're gonna have to learn, but even when you're like, what is cross-site scripting? You can go look that up and you understand all the language that they're using to describe that. And that is such an advantage because okay. it's like, oh, I already know all these protocols. I already know how all of these things connect together. And having that background knowledge is, it gives you such a, an advantage when you're switching versus if you're just kind of starting out. BGP, the routing protocol that holds the internet together, has a pretty significant flaw. See, the internet is made up of a bunch of smaller networks that all connect together to make one massive global network. And the way that this is done is through a protocol called BGP. The problem is, is that anybody that has control over a BGP router can advertise any routes that they want and pretend to be anybody that they want. And this has kind of caused a big problem. See, this is called a BGP hijacking attack and it's a bigger issue than you would expect considering you have to have access to a BGP router to do this successfully. But here's an example of a Russian ISP advertising routes for Google, Facebook, Apple, and Microsoft. And this causes big outages and really frustrates these companies because there's nothing they can do to stop it. When these routes are advertised, traffic that's in intended for those websites is actually redirected to this random ISP. And in this case, they used DNS hijacking, spoofed a cryptocurrency website, and then stole $152,000 worth of cryptocurrency. So let's talk about OSI, everyone's favorite. So oh networking gosh. lower layers, yep. are you finding now in cyber, you moving more into the upper layers, like attacking websites, that kind of thing? I'm definitely in the higher, higher layers, but it all is connected, right? So, I mean, one thing that you use a lot is the transport layer. So UDP and TCP, and there's a lot of different attacks or vulnerabilities that you can do or understand by really understanding the transport layer or again, the protocols and things. Like the one video I did on BGP hijacking, I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, how these big attacks happen is it's usually not just one thing. It's a bunch of things chained together to make this, this attack happen. Any knowledge that you get is not wasted. Exactly like you said, if you understand networking or you understand something in tech, everything else is kind of connected to it. So let's talk about UCS because that's servers and virtualization. That must have helped you a lot as well. Yeah, and the troubleshooting or log analysis. When I was working in tech, it was very heavy with log analysis because you would have to do root cause analysis to figure out what the problem was with troubleshooting. And so all of those things really helped me with testing, because it's like, oh, I need to go through logs, I need to understand Linux, which is a big one, yeah. I need to understand Windows, servers, how those work, how virtualization works. So it was a big benefit as well. All that knowledge just adds to itself, um, and it's exponential, I find that. It's not one plus one equals two, it's like one plus one equals five. If you, <laughs> if you keep adding these skills, you know, it helps yeah. you grow. What would you tell your younger self if you were 18 or I was 18, what would you advise us to do? I would explore as many possibilities and throw out the ones you don't like as quickly as possible. It's okay if you pick up something and you're like, I learned all this stuff, but it's not for me. Yeah. Don't feel bad because like you said, that's not wasted time. It really truly isn't because you might pick up something there that you'll use later. So try out different types of like, you can try out development, there's incident response, there's threat hunting, you could try networking, you could try learning cloud, which also is great to have a networking background. Yep. Um, and whenever you find something that you're not that interested in, it's cool to say not interested and start working on something else and really figure out early on by trying out as many things as you can, what you're most interested in and then follow from there. Like I started off in networking and then I I was like, hey, now I'm more interested in cybersecurity. I don't feel like I necessarily left an entire networking career behind because I took all that with me. Life's a journey, isn't it? And it's um, if you've done this for a long time, it's you get into different technologies along the way. Oh, yeah. I was just talking to someone earlier. I'd spent a lot of time learning OpenFlow. That's not something that actually got used in the real world so much, but it, that kind of understanding is not wasted knowledge because that kind of like thinking um, or paradigm has affected other things like network automation. And, you know, it's fine to, you know, take different paths and do different things. So I, I, I really agree with you. We've been going for a while. What advice do you have or any final words 
before we wrap it up or is there anything you want to say? Thank you so much for having me on because I know this is funny, but when I was in college, a lot of my friends would watch your video. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. That's and great. so it's funny now because it's like when people were studying for CCNA or all those things. When I was in college, not just, you know, baby networking person. Um, and now it's like, wow, this really came full circle, you it know? Does, yeah. So. I'm like, that's, that's awesome. It's possible because I, you know, made that content and put myself out there and definitely took on some criticism, <laughs> but, um, you know, just for people out there, like I said, I think the biggest thing that stops a lot of people from content creation is worrying about potentially nobody's going to see it or care, but do it again. Like I said, do it for yourself and have it as a body of work to show other people or potential employers in the future and follow whatever your interest is. Go where it takes you. I spoke to um, to other people who've done the same thing, like Jeremy's IT Labs. He said he also like was watching my content. What I think is fantastic is you've learned something from me, perhaps, or you know people who've learned stuff from me, but you're giving back to the community. And I find that if you give back to the community like you've done or like Jeremy's done, that only helps you in your career because people notice when you give and when you're nice, people notice that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a big advocate, you know, create content, like you said, and I love what you said, even if it's just for yourself. Yeah, no expectations, do it. <laughs> my YouTube channel has been going for years and years and years. I mean, the beginning content was awful. I look at some of my my videos, I've got like a hundred views. Even to this day, they've still got so few views, which for me is, is awful in today's terms. But, you know, don't despise the day of small beginnings because you know you started nothing and it can only get bigger. Any last words because I'm 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 waffling now. Is there anything you want to say? Well, hopefully if you are interested, follow my YouTube. I'm going to have um, I'm going to do some more longer form content. I kind of gauge how well the shorts do and then say, "All right, maybe people are interested in, in a fuller video of this." But yeah. But any subscribers, thanks. Love it. <laughs> Please go and subscribe, show some love for the channel that we can get Serena onto YouTube and off TikTok because <laughs> um, we want to grow her YouTube audience. So please go and subscribe and follow on Twitter. I'll put all those links below. Serena, thanks so much for sharing. Thank you.